So thank you for joining us, Amy. I know you have a story you would like to share. And with all stories, the good place to start is at the beginning, when times were good. Uh, when times were good, uh, they were somewhat too good to be true. Jonah and I met through baseball and expos related events. And my mom had just passed away. I was not in a very good place. And suddenly there was this person who mirrored all of the things that I discussed valuing. It was very intense, it was very quick, and suddenly he wanted to move to Montreal into my condo. What seemed really charming at first quickly felt claustrophobic. I was sort of led to believe that it was my own commitment issues and that perhaps this is why you've Remain single as long as you have, and why don't you let me take care of you? And then I got pregnant, and things started to change pretty quickly at that point. I was definitely surprised, but had always wanted to have a child. And suddenly there was a lot of pressure from him that we should get married. Meaning like within months of even yes. meeting? Yes. Okay. He suddenly had all of these stories to tell me, and it was so strange the way that it all happened. Is he confessing to violence against those women? Not to violence. One thing which strikes me about the domestic violence issue as well in sports is that video seems to change everything. Yeah. Which makes me almost sadder than anything. Why don't we just take the word of the person who said, this person did these horrible things to me? No, no, we have to have video evidence. Yeah. You know, it's very easy to be cynical, and no matter what the person says, you're just like, yeah, but you beat the crap out of this person. Yeah. I don't care what you do. I don't care how many kumbayas or whatever. Is forgiveness, is that something we should strive to have or should we not ever do that? And I believed that that was how he felt and I thought I was getting one of the good ones. That led to him not feeling worthy in his own opinion at the time. Um, I had shamed him. That led to the first incident of abuse. And it was basically, well, I'm sick, I must have a brain tumor, I've never done this before, I would never hurt you, I love you, I want to kill myself, I can't live with myself. And then it happened again. I didn't do it on purpose! What did you, what were you trying to do? Nothing! I lost my mind! I don't want to feel like this! You broke my nose, poured water on me and spat in And I apologize, I feel terrible for that. In the court doc, there were, quote, 14 incidents of violence against you in less than seven months. The first two were before you got married, correct? Mm -hmm. There were more than that. That's just the agreed upon okay. facts. Yeah. As this is all happening, you guys are moving closer to your wedding. Yeah. And then there's an incident that happens right before your wedding, right? Mm -hmm. Like that elevator video just happens to be caught on tape, but the general state of the relationship was well represented in that elevator video. It was- Which was before the marriage. Which, which was before, before the marriage, okay. yeah. As the video is extremely disturbing for anyone to watch. Um, it's most disturbing for me to watch because it's as though I'm not in that video. And in some ways I sort of wasn't. My reaction after, um, like I did, it took me like 30 seconds to press the button. I just sort of stood there and like looked down at the ground and my, what was going through my head at the time wasn't, I have to call the police. It was, I'm so humiliated that the doorman probably saw this and I have to live in this building and walk around and these people must be judging me and what is wrong with me that I can't leave. I have this wedding plan for a few days from now and if I call it off, he's going to kill me. So I went along with it, despite not wanting to be married to him, not knowing what else to do and putting one foot in front of the other. Based on the way that the law works, I would most likely have to share custody with this person who was threatening my life and the life of my unborn child, and using that as a way to ensure that I couldn't leave. I realized that unless I started to document what he was doing, no one would believe me, and my concern was honestly that he was going to kill me and get away with it. I want people to hear this out loud. During these incidents, the offender punched the victim in the knees, hit her on the head and on her ears, pushed her, dragged her on the ground, slapped her, bit her, spat in her face, headbutted her, 
shook her, pulled her hair, and grabbed her by the shoulders while threatening to throw her off a balcony. He threw various objects at her. He took a knife and threatened to remove the baby she was carrying in her womb. He also threatened to kill her with the knife. The victim's nose was fractured during an incident when the offender headbutted her. During this period, the offender threatened to kill the victim several times. He also said he wished she would commit suicide. When they were in the car, he threatened to cause an accident to kill them both. Yeah, and that's a very limited summary of events. There was one time your dog came to your rescue. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, I got home, said hi to him, tried to keep it as quick as possible, and said I have a phone call that I have to make upstairs. He was so hurt that I had walked in and not even hugged him. I went downstairs, and his response was, uh, we're going to have a really big problem right now, with a smile on his face. And he stood up and held me against the wall by my neck. And I couldn't breathe and couldn't, I had no, he's six foot four and weighed double what I weighed. And I had no means of protecting myself at all. My dog tried to attack him, which stunned him enough that he stopped for a minute. And I was able to eventually get away. I called my friend and told her what happened. And I said, you need to call my brother in the morning and tell him because I might chicken out, and once he knows, there's no going back. He was then arrested. You didn't speak up at first, mm -hmm. thought things would get better. Yeah. I wonder, in retrospect, would you have done anything different, or do you know now that's just how this goes and you can't really prepare for that? Certainly there were warning signs when things start off as a whirlwind when things seem too good to be true, they are. But the onus is not on victims to you know, avoid abusers. Like, yeah, yes, it would be great if we all saw these warning signs and listened to them, but it's easier said than done. It's why I appreciate um, being able to speak out to someone who works in sports, because the way that this stuff is talked about and reported about makes it really hard for victims to come out. Are there general lessons you think baseball can learn from your experience, whether it's I mean, the baseball's league, the a writers, whatever it is? I for our society, just like every other sport. And will there be blood on baseball's hands if they didn't report it? Is it enough to suspend somebody and keep it quiet? And you know, should we be giving these abusers a platform? What do you want people to know? Words have really big power. We don't know when we could end up in these situations or when our friends or our sisters or our brothers could end up in these situations, but support for the survivors is extremely important. I don't have the answers and I don't have all the resources, but everything is scarier in the dark.